Well, hey, everybody, we're glad you are with us today. We have a really nice discussion about the HIBA, the High Efficiency Broadcast Antenna that has been constructed up in Massachusetts. And over the past several years, uh, Grady Motes, uh, David Baxson, and uh, several others like Kurt Gorman have been involved in uh, putting this together in a way that uh, it's a different set of antennas. And so let me turn it over to you, Grady, and let's get started. Howdy. This HEBA concept is not a new one, and I did not invent the basic concept. Morris Haitley, a professor at a university, may he lie in perpetual low-level excitation in RF heaven, and a room full of his students in his classroom were thinking out of the box about physics years ago. And they came up with this interesting concept that flipped electromagnetic theory over on its side and looked at it from a different perspective. Morris had a room full of young people who had not yet been convinced by the establishment that there, there were a bunch of things that are just impossible. Well, the idea they developed was that Maxwell's ideas, while extremely well conceived and proven to be accurate up to that point in time, could be interpreted in other ways without breaking any laws. And the result was a number of unique new design possibilities for antennas. Great inventions begin this way. X is impossible, gets thrown out the window, and smart people with open minds kick around crazy ideas. Over some time, Morris and his crew tried a lot of things in the lab that did not work. They also tried some things that produced interesting results, and they fiddled with those, making changes to their setups, and developed a few arrangements of, let's call them radiating elements, that yielded unique performance measurement results. This is the scientific method, married to the engineering method. Take a theoretical idea, make something to test it, get results, figure out how it might work differently or better, change the setup, and repeat. This is where all the fun is in this business. I wish I could have been there. Well, years later I was there. In 1999 at the NAB convention in Las Vegas, Morris had some of his crew there to do a formal presentation during the NAB engineering conference proceedings. It looked interesting, so I attended joining a large number of other interested folks from our business. And when they were done up on the stage, I felt like I had just watched Thomas Edison describe some of his work out on the edge before audio recording or incandescent light were a thing. So I went back of the room to pick up any documentation I might find on the table. There wasn't much, but I still have it in my office. This is what I picked up off the back table. And uh, I'll go through it now. Let's see if I can do that. This is the actual proceedings from that event. And you can see that Fadi Kabari was there and Brian Stewart was there. Morris Haitley was not actually there, but he is in the paper that's being presented. And you can see that this is really complete. There's all kinds of useful information, including elevation pattern and Smith charts showing what the bandwidth of the antenna is. So um, I lost this for a time and I found it a few months ago. So I thought I would include it um, in my presentation this morning. So when I turned around, the room was full of people who were laughing and talking and saying things like this breaks all the laws of physics and it can't possibly work. Well, I was embarrassed to see so much disrespect after these people had worked so hard to tell us their story of research and development. But I left the room. I went to the next presentation and let that whole experience slip into my memory. Let's cut forward 11 years to 2010. Um, I was just moving into a new house with a lot of space for my new shop and, and a new warehouse of parts and gear that I was using for, to be my radio scientist guy, and the phone rang. It was a person I had worked with 30 years before in the early 80s when WMEX in Boston had changed owners and formats to become WITS, Information, Talk, and Sports. And aside here, after a year of working there, 
I agreed with others on the staff that WITS really stood for, what is this shit? Okay, there's the open with a joke part. We'll move on. So I visited on the phone for a few minutes with this person, and then all of a sudden he asks me this. Have you ever heard about a thing called a CFA, a cross-field antenna? Why, yes, I have. I was at the NAB in 1999 when it got laughed out of the room. He says, well, I'm working with a group of investors that's planning to build one in western Massachusetts, and I'm looking for an engineer to be our field general contractor to direct the building of it. Are you interested? To this day, I have no idea how this guy remembered me for 30 years, how he got my number, but I was immediately excited. Within a couple of weeks, I was signed to a contract for a fair monthly flat rate to do whatever needed doing on that project. But I did make it clear that it had to be done as a scientific method process or I wasn't interested. This is what the data looks like in an FIM 4100 when you make field intensity measurements the way it was designed. It comes out in this beautiful spreadsheet. It's actually a database and it's almost impossible to fake anything in here. It takes so many different pieces of data and puts it in such an organized fashion that you might as well just go do the measurements and not sit in a motel room for a weekend to do your proof. So there you go. Um, then we had to design and build this thing from scratch. Here's where it gets interesting. The investors had contacted Brian Stewart in Scotland, who is one of the people that was at that NAB presentation, who had done quite a bit of work with Morris Haightley building one on the Isle of Man. Hang on. Um, and they had uh, built this. And I really, I found this online today. I've never seen it before. Those are the same guys building the Hadron Collider. <laughs> <laughs> So um, the reason that this is important is because, let me see if I can get rid of that now, because I don't need it anymore. Um, th they also weren't able to make measurements, useful measurements that the FCC would pay attention to on that. Apparently it took them so long to get it to work that by the time they got it working, the people that they had rented the land from said, you guys got to get off this land and you got to do it now. So they drove down a road and took, I don't know, eight or 10 measurements a single time on a single path uh, and, and called it done. So that's how that happened. Well, my investors had received a one page CAD drawing from Brian Stewart, and it had two sets of relative dimensions that were suggested starting points to build one. And I'd like to thank Brian for that now. He'll probably see this video later. However, I did some research and I found photographs of several other CFAs that had been built and were reportedly working. You'll notice that in that drawing, in that video just now, that was a big thing. I mean, it was large and the dimensions of what Brian sent were very small. Um, so I did some math and determined that of all the antennas that I had found uh, pictures of that that were supposed to have worked, that they were larger when expressed as a function of the operating frequency than the dimensions in that CAD file. So I told the investors we should build ours larger so that if we did not achieve useful results at 940, the licensed frequency of the station in Webster that we were going to be working at, we could use the experimental antenna that we had built in the expanded band up above 16 kilohertz. Well, it turns out that was a really good decision not wanting to poison the project with people on board who didn't have an open mind i called my old buddy kurt gorman at phase tech in pennsylvania to work with us he was happy to jump on the team 
Kurt and I designed the D-plate and the E-cylinder using materials Kurt already had access to, as well as equipment in his shop to cut, manipulate, and solder or weld things together. All of the pieces parts got fabbed at Phase Tech, and then we brought them up to Webster in a big truck. Kurt and I also designed the first platform, and I hired a local deck and dock contractor to build it for us around the base of the tower we were going to take down. No point in showing you pictures of that now. They are in uh, earlier presentations that I did for uh, the BDR.net, and you can find them in the video history pages. Um, my buddy John Garrett designed and built the copper ground plane atop that platform, and as it grew, I was down underneath retuning the ATU feeding the tower so the transmitter would stay on and the station could stay on the air. When the deck was done, we brought in a crane to disassemble the old tower in three large pieces, lowering the, the brown to the ground carefully in case we had to put it back up later. That turned out later to be a useful for a different reason. By the way, John Garrett also did all of the field intensity measurements on the old tower with my FIM 4100, as well as six of the eight radials on the HEBA that were used for our later comparisons and our efficiency study that uh, got done, which I'll talk about in a minute. And I can bring those up on the screen in Q&A if anyone is interested. And also, by the way, John will be at the NAB next week with Kurt Gorman in the Phase Tech booth for in-person discussions. So if you make it out there, be sure to stop by and say hi. I'll have to save myself to be at the International Broadcasters Idea Bank Conference in late May in New York. We built four different versions of that first antenna, changing the size of the platform once and the height of the E-cylinder twice, and never achieved useful efficiency at 940. The station ran for several months running the E-cylinder as if it was a standard monopole, but the resulting signal was only about 15% of what the station license needed, so we ended up putting up a long wire that could be could be taken down and put back up easily using a boat trailer winch on a tree of the hill. Well, when we couldn't get any further than that with that antenna, the investors were ready to shut down and give up when I reminded them about having scaled Brian's drawing up so that if it didn't work at 940, we could continue with a structure that was similar in electrical size to the CFAs that worked in Egypt. And if we moved up above 1600, maybe we could make it work. Did we really do that? They asked. Why, yes, we did, I said. The company lost much of its funding about this time due to the tragic passing of a major investor, so several years of reduced activity ensued. I couldn't work for free at that time, so after some time passed, a new investor group formed and resumed work with Kurt, Broadcast Tower Service, and John Garrett, while I kind of watched from the wings and assisted from time to time. The FCC did grant an experimental license for us to change our operating frequency during midnight to 5 a.m. hours to 1620, and I had a lot of coils and vacuum variable caps in my warehouse from the old RCA 50 kilowatt transmitter I had disassembled and removed from the WITS site, and they got used a lot during Kurt's early work at 1620 kilohertz. When Kurt got it working in late 2017, yay, Kurt, <laughs> I got my PI-4100 recalibrated, and Kurt used it for his six radial proof measurements for the filing of the FCC 302 AM for daytime license to cover. Once again, I called another old friend, Charlie Hecht, to, to handle preparations of the engineering reports for filing with the FCC. Obviously, again, I chose him because he's another open-minded person who looks at the data, creates the needed information, and reports on what he sees. He doesn't enter anything with preconceived notions. Long story short, the efficiency of our new Hebo was a perfect match for the old tower. And you know what? I think I would like to show you that. Uh, can I get back to that? Uh, ba -dee, ba -dee, ba -dee. Yes, I can, because it was in, there it is. On the left is the original tower proof readings as analyzed for efficiency at a kilometer. And on the right 
are the measurements that we used for the uh, HEBA 103 proof readings. Um, you'll notice that uh, we had used eight points on our 2010 measurements, and there were only six points available uh, when uh, um, Kurt Gorman filed for uh, the uh, 302 for day operation. But you'll notice that it's almost exactly the same RMS at a kilometer. Uh, and the only difference about it is it's a little less irregular. And we believe, although can't prove, that that is because having this radiating system on top of a platform away from the dirt decouples it from the dirt in such a way that it's not affected as much by local ground conductivity. So there you go. Oh, be -dee -be -dee -be -dee. where was I? Point of fact here, um, 940 is a Canadian clear channel and is under international agreement for certain performance guarantees, one of which is protection at the U.S.-Canadian border both day and night of the 50-kilowatt co-channel station in Montreal. This is important because the RF of the Webster station is purposefully a bit low in its original design by Ed Perry, who put this station on the air originally. It's low on purpose so that skywave interference during critical hours does not create interference to CFNV within Canada. This also forces the Webster station to operate at exceedingly low power at night, and it is the reason why I brought in yet another old friend with an open mind, David Maxson of Isotrope LLC. Here's how that happened. I spent four years working with Kurt to create submissions to the FCC that would get us a license to operate at night with the HEBA, but to the FCC's credit, they wanted the mathematics to predict the elevation pattern of the HEBA accurately to ensure that CFNV was not going to receive new interference from us. The FCC wanted good, hard science. My work with Kurt's help was not good enough, so we were at a stalemate. Then, in May of 2022, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, a division of the U.S. government, released a new version of the MINI-NEC program, version 5, that for the first time made modeling of a large conductive plate in an antenna system much, much easier to evaluate. Uh, there's a huge D-plate in the HEBA. So my next step was to find engineers who were facile with MINI-NEC to join my team. David was happy to tell me that he has friends who fit that description perfectly. So I stepped aside and David took over, just as he is going to take over right now. David? And here's my opening joke. Um, <laughs> uh, this picture reminds me a little bit of uh, Andrew Wyeth's famous painting, Christina, um, Christina's World. And uh, what we have here is a photograph of Grady's world. Um, and this is on top of the, uh, the top plate, the, the, the uh, D plate, as it's called, the top of the capacitor above the ground plane, which you can see uh, below it. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks, Grady. Uh, we've occasionally gotten involved in crackpot schemes. And uh, uh, when Grady sucked me into this one, I thought, well, what can I do to help problem solve here? Um, I have, uh, I think, more experience dealing with uh, regulatory language than I do with uh, uh, neck modeling, but I have a good friend in the UK who, uh, uh, who is really uh, talented uh, with the uh, application, uh, Peter Zalman, and uh, he, uh, he was intrigued by the whole question of how to uh, uh, answer the FCC's question. Um, I'm going to slide in the uh, FCC regulations for um, vertical plane radiation characteristics. And as some of you may recall, um, that when you're dealing with a tower, that uh, uh, you have some specific facts that you have about it, um, you can plug into an F theta formula um, the electrical height of the tower. And they have a couple, FCC has a couple of different models, uh, a, uh, a straight section, a straight section with a top hat and uh, a sectionalized uh, antenna. 
Um, and uh, so at first, the idea was to try to uh, simply um, come up with a uh, 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 an electrical height, and that was what uh, Grady and uh, his team uh, originally tried to do in order to plug in an equation to come up with a pattern. Um, and the FCC's response was, well, this antenna is not shaped like any uh, uh, thin wire <laughs> a vertical uh, a radiator, um, and uh, uh, we're, we're not so sure that we, we can um, translate uh, the F theta equation in the FCC regulations to this kind of a structure. So we need uh, what comes in, this is part B of uh, 73.160, but in part C, um, adds, okay. Anyway, in part C, it says, instead of using our standard equations, uh, you, you can uh, provide an equation, just a straight equation that you've developed and show us how you developed that equation. So the answer there was to uh, use the, uh, the, the neck modeling tool to come up with an equation uh, to give to the FCC. Uh, this is a little bit of a catch-22 because um, uh, they, they said, well, you can't, you can't use standard methods. You have to come up with your own method. But what method is there besides computer modeling? Um, historically, we looked at a lot of the records, and uh, Ron Rackley and, and some other uh, engineers uh, uh, worked with uh, Valcom and uh, with Kinstar, uh, uh, getting uh, FCC approvals for those antennas, which are also electrically short. And one of the problems with electri electrically short antennas is you can't really do a current distribution measurement in order to estimate the electrical length in order to plug it into that 73.160b equation and to get a, a, a vertical pattern. Um, so what we did was, um, uh, Peter was just genius at this. He, uh, he built a, a computer model and I, that picture that I took of Grady up there, um, is the results of us going up there and doing a bunch of um, measurements and of physical measurements and electrical measurements to help uh, Peter do his uh, computer modeling. And I apologize for the dog in the background. The mailman must be coming. Um, and so just real quick, uh, as a result of quite a bit of work and fine tuning, uh, ultimately, uh, uh, Peter came up with this, uh, uh, with a model that, that works. And just to call your attention to what's happening here, there is quite a density of uh, electric field lines to the uh, ground plane. Physical ground is down here 20 feet below. And you can see that uh, what's happening here with uh, this design is that the um, uh, this is a, a dual feed system, and I don't know, Grady may have uh, gone into that a little bit at, at other times, but um, so there are two drive points on this antenna, one dealing with the capacitor that's in this area at the base, and the other dealing with the, the vertical uh, element, which is um, uh, referred to as the E cylinder. Um, and as Grady said, this original concept was uh, Haitley's concept that Grady said, flipped electromagnetic theory on its side. What we had to do was to flip electromagnetic theory back and say, we can model this with neck, can't we? Um, and there was some uncertainty as to whether uh, it would work, but uh, ultimately we were um, quite pleased with uh, the results that, uh, that Peter got. Um, so that's a close in view. Here is electric and magnetic field um, and what this is, is over uh, you know, one, one cycle of, of RF um, and over a longer distance, uh, uh, two kilometers. You can see how the near field, just like any antenna, is uh, a little bit uh, unformed. And then you get out a certain distance and you can see the, uh, the propagating wave pattern. Um, and uh, as uh, uh, Grady likes to point out, this antenna does not need to be tuned seasonally. It is, it is just impervious to uh, seasonal changes in the ground conditions below it. 
unlike the tower that used to be there. Uh, so this is, a, I think, from my perspective, one of the important features of this, uh, this design, plus the fact that there is no ground system. It is a ground plane, and this one has uh, eight uh, grounded legs supporting the ground plane, uh, about 20 feet above ground. And do I have any other pictures? Oh, just have one more. Let me just uh, jump on this. So in order to satisfy the FCC, we said, well, it's an antenna. It probably has a pattern that we can find an F theta um, for formula for. In other words, we can find an electrical length that will make the equation work. Uh, and so Peter ran this uh, iterative process where every, uh, uh, fraction of a degree, he uh, uh, matched, uh, compared the um, the F theta pattern to the computed pattern that Neck produced, and came up with an exact uh, quote unquote air quotes electrical length or electrical height of thirty two point eight nine degrees. Uh, so what we did is we we didn't measure or or infer the electrical height and then plug it into the, the equation according to 73.160b, we did it the other way. We used the equation to figure out what the electrical height ought to be in order to match neck. And then in doing that, we, we came up with a result where uh, we're just uh, basically off by fractions of a percent. Um, so we have a as, as perfect a match as you'll ever see between an antenna pattern in neck and the antenna pattern that uh, that uh, is is given to the FCC, and they had a little trouble wrapping their heads around that because they wanted to treat it as the electrical length, and they wanted us to tell them why we came up with that electrical length in order to plug it into the formula. And we said, no, 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 it's the other way around. We have a very accurate computer model of this pattern, and we have gone backwards to use the formula to figure out what electrical length makes the formula match the NEC pattern. And uh, a number of conference calls with the FCC, and uh, you know, they checked with the the media bureau, checked with uh, 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 engineering and technologies, and. Uh, they went back and forth, and it was quite a uh, quite a process to convince everyone that we were not pulling the wool over their eyes, <laughs> but in fact, we we're using what the FCC recognizes as the gold standard in a lot of other uh, circumstances in broadcast and in other um, fields in in its uh, purview, and that is you, you'd use a neck model to get as accurate a, a uh, prediction of the behavior of the system as you possibly can. So um, ultimately, uh, the FCC said, we get it. And uh, they uh, approved the uh, facility for nighttime operation. And there we go. Back to you. Thank you, David. Uh <laughs> Good to be back in front of y'all. Um, I'm gonna uh, show you a few more things and then we'll go into the Q&A. Um, let's see here. If you remember the um, measurements that I showed you that the FIM 4100 keeps and that John Garrett had made in 2019, I wanna show you the results from that because it's uh, very, very useful and interesting to further show the high efficiency of the HEBA. Uh, these are the far field point by point comparison measurements between the measurements made in 2010 and 2016 by John Garrett uh, on the tower before it was taken down and on the HEBA after it was licensed for daytime operation. The only two radials that matched between the six radials that Kurt Gorman made for his uh, filing to the FCC for uh, for daytime operation and the and the uh, measurements that we made were we did eight radials so only the 90 degree and 270 degree radials actually line up. So this is how those measurements made in 2010 and 2016 compare. And you'll notice that the, the red HEBA measurements are almost exactly the same 
as the measurements made on the tower in 2010. Then we made uh, six more measurements on the HEBA uh, in uh, 2019 to fill in the other six radials that we needed to do that full point by point comparison from the 2010 measurements and the measurements of the HEBA. So you'll notice that nine years had passed between the tower measurements that we made and these additional measurements on the HEBA. Uh, and you'll notice that we have exactly the same almost perfect tracking on all the radials, even to the point where when we go from point to point, you can see that the measurements track. Uh, I was really amazed that there was that much correspondence between the measurements since the 2010 measurements and the 2019 measurements were made at different times of year. So that shows you that, that the HEBA seems to be much less uh, responsive to changes in the environment. And of course, we also see that because the load impedance that the transmitter sees doesn't change from summer to winter now, we no longer have to change the match to the antenna system to keep that DAX1 transmitter happy. Now we're going to look quickly at bandwidth. Uh, the green trace is plus and minus 10 kilohertz on a Smith chart of the HEBA as it was built and as it is being used still to this day. Uh, you'll notice that it's a very smooth curve and it's symmetrical about the center line of that curve. But it's still, uh, it's plus and minus 10 kilohertz bandwidth is outside the area where we, we would like it to be for better performance with audio quality and uh, iBot carriers. So Kurt Gorman did a little work and he designed some bandwidth flattening modifications to the networks that feed the HEBA and the result was this which is a much more symmetrical, much smaller mismatch at the sideband frequencies, and it's symmetrical about the resistance line on the Smith chart at the transmitter's combining point for its uh, output power modules, and this is the proper way to have the antenna rotated on the Smith chart within the transmitter where those power amplifiers are summed. This work never got done because the station sounds fine the way it was. It was on the air making money for the licensees, and they did not want to shut down to make uh, changes to the antenna system. Uh, I think um, um, at, at this point, John Garrett, who is going to be at the NAB, uh, is sitting there, and he's got a microphone. And let's see if he has a few comments to toss in here, because he made almost all of the FIM measurements that we used uh, for Charlie Hecht in his analyses of the antenna. And then we can open the floor to questions. Yeah, I uh, spent a lot of time uh, on this project as well. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, we uh, did most of the fabrication of the original um, prototype on site. We brought the tubing in and we had uh, jigs to uh, do our tubing bending and we soldered the thing together. It was all The first one was all made of copper. And now uh, we're building out of stainless because it has much better structural uh, strength. Uh, if there's anybody who has any questions about it, um, happy to answer whatever I can. And Grady and David are here as well, obviously. Um, I was uh, surprised at how symmetrical this antenna was. And, uh, and it seems to outperform the, the stick that was there to begin with. And uh, so those two things uh, were very encouraging to me, I guess. And I think still, you know, if anybody wants to come to come to Webster and bring your meter and look at the transmitter output and go do measurements, uh, we're happy to uh, to host you. Well, I think we've reached a pivot point here. So um, I imagine that uh, Grady or uh, David or John would uh, welcome any questions that you might have. And to do that, just press your space bar or alternate A to open your microphone and uh, ask away.
Grady, uh, what did your total height end up being? The uh, total overall height from the ground, uh, including 20 feet of platform on average, because it's on a hillside, um, which, by the way, I was going to say there was a reason why it was a good thing we were careful about the way we took the old tower down. Uh, we were able to use six of the sections from the original tower to support the weight underneath the platform of the E cylinder. So at the center, uh, the, the uh, platform is exactly 20 feet tall. The overall height, when you then add the D plate, and the E-cylinder with the insulators that support those two pieces is 72 feet. And by the way, uh, Barry um, said he called the antenna the um, um, high efficiency broadcast antenna. The B actually stands for high efficiency broadband antenna. And uh, I showed you in the Smith chart what the bandwidth is like. The bandwidth is not bad at all when you just use minimum parts count networks to drive it, and it can be tightened up very easily just by adding about three components to those networks. But the point about it being broadband is, if you take a monopole that's 72 feet tall, and you try to get broad bandwidth out of it, go home. It's not going to happen because the the impedance the drive point impedance of that thing is is so low for one and the slope of the change in resistance and reactance at that point is so so steep and every time you go through a a, a matching network uh if that matching network has uh, over about uh, 45 degrees of phase shift that is another thing that creates a high Q situation that reduces the actual bandwidth of the antenna. So this antenna is broad bandwidth compared with any antenna that I know of that is that short expressed as a percentage of wavelength. Hi, uh, Grady and uh, presenters. What uh, can you tell us about uh, the audience reaction to this in the, in the signal area? All right. Well, uh, I was in contact with uh, the people who ran it because fortunately for this whole project, uh, the reason that the FCC even allowed us to build this in the first place was because for the first time, someone wanted to build one of these things on a licensed channel that they actually owned the license of. And three of the people that were on the board of directors of the original Crossfield Antenna Limited organization had this license. Um, so um, the answer to your question is, they actually had a huge history about the way this antenna worked before. Number one, and uh, David mentioned it in, in quick passing, Every spring and fall, they would have to send somebody out there with a bridge and retune the ATU because the difference between summer and winter was so dramatic that the Harris DAX-1 would literally burp on modulation peaks. Number two, um, the measurements that we have made, uh, obviously, um, if you want to see this um I'll, I'll show you this now in, in case you've never seen this this part of it before i'm going to share again i'm going to click on that i'm going to open up the um the powerpoint again which i had closed and then i'm going to scan down and see if i can find the measurements that we took all right these are far field point by point comparisons where we took the measurements that we made in 2010 before we took the tower down and we went back to the exact same locations in 20, I want to say 17, 2018 uh, and remeasured those same points with the same meter after it was calibrated both times. Uh, 2016, yeah. Um, and these numbers are, 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 again, they're very close. Um, the original proof that we did in uh, 2010 was an eight radial proof when um, 
Kurt Gorman did his proof to submit to the FCC. He only did six radials because it, it, at the time it was like January and he wanted to get it done and get out of there. So, so uh, he didn't do the eight radials. Also, one of those radials is really hard to travel. Uh, um, John Garrett can tell you about it. So we had to go back and measure six more radials on the Heba after the fact, because the only radials that Kurt measured were the 90 and the two and the 270 that agreed with radials that we used back in 2010. But once again, the red curves are the actual Heba measurements that we made in 2019 on these radials and in 2010 on the tower. And, and once again, you can see a, a, a dramatic paralleling of that stuff. Um, now that I've said that, um, it's important that that you know that anything else that we talk about here is um, supposition and it's hearsay. Um, we heard from some of our listeners who had no reason to tell us anything because we weren't telling people that we were actually experimenting with this thing. Uh, we were told that uh, the signal didn't go any further, but they said that within the coverage area that the station had had before on the tower, it seemed that the signal was more solid, like under power lines a little bit better, going under bridges a little bit better. Uh, it was a more cohesive covering of the coverage pattern that it used to have. Now, we can't prove that. We and and. What would we be proving anyway? The tower's gone. Uh, we're just basing this on, on observations made by non-technical people. Um, I have my own crazy ideas, but David has been very careful to tell me when I have crazy ideas and I should not share them. <laughs> uh, thank, so, you. thank you, Grady. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> Now, this is of particular interest to me because the station was my first affiliate on the WOR radio network. Um, the question I have is, uh, maybe it's a little too soon, can this be used in a directional array? Um, David can chime in on this. Um, here is my position. That's the very next step that I plan to take with this antenna. Um, um, I have been saving the license of a radio station in Hamden, New, uh, Hamden, Connecticut, that had a two tower directional pattern before they literally lost their site because the university that owned it said, why do we have a radio station? We're just going to turn the license in and sell the land in the transmitter building. So I was able to uh, get Clark Smith to allow me to help him save that license by putting it on a long wire on a goat farm a mile away. That goat farm is large enough to put two Hebas on it in a geometry that will allow us to rebuild the directional pattern that it was using, which incidentally, it's another one of these clear channel protection situations because there's a first adjacent signal in Philadelphia which uh, is 50,000 watt clear channel. And that is what we have to protect at night. And the station with its two tower array had built a night pattern that protected the 50 kilowatt. And then they just turned the power up during the daytime to whatever the FCC would give them. And they operated with that for many years. So as soon as we uh, complete the process, of getting this antenna approved for nighttime, we're going to try to build another one and get it licensed for day, and then do the same analyses that uh, David did uh, for this antenna in Webster, submit it to the commission and see if we can get approval for nighttime at this second location. Parallel to that, uh, we are planning to Shortly uh, after that, we're planning to approach the FCC with an application for a directional pattern. But my prediction is 
and David, you can tell me to shut up. <laughs> My prediction is that the, because these antennas are physically so much shorter, and because the mutual impedance between the D plate and the E cylinder and the two fields that are being radiated by that, David was able to show you in those live animated patterns how the two elements are actually feeding power back and forth between them in the process of doing whatever the heck it is that they're doing. Um, my feeling is that you can put two antennas in a standard pattern positioning on a piece of dirt and each of them won't have a buried ground system or guy wires it'll be just two platforms that are however neat, uh, large they need to be and the mutual impedance between those two radiators should be so small that there should be no interaction in the adjustments as you're trying to bring the actual array of two hebas into phase and amplitude to create the pattern on the ground with the nulls in the direction that you need them to be for protection purposes and the major lobe or lobes in the direction then that you get to have over an audience. Is that clear? Yes, yeah, great, David here, just to kind of add to that, um, yeah, I've completely what he said. And um, from our perspective, one of the things we still need to learn more about this, uh, the system at at different frequencies and in different situations. So the uh, the, the upcoming opportunities that uh, we have to put in uh, one of these hebas on a different frequency, uh, perhaps near the coast or in some other kind of environment, uh, we can try to replicate what what was learned at in Webster, Massachusetts, um, and. Uh, in that process, we, because we have this very detailed NEC model, um, we can start messing with materials and uh, dimensions and components and uh, really learn a little bit more about how to um, uh, value engineer the system and how to uh, develop the, uh, the related uh, tuning components. Um, at this point, I, I think the tuning part, which is a black art as far as I'm concerned, and thankfully Kurt Gorman was uh, uh, Johnny on the spot on uh, doing the various iterations of uh, tuning this uh, this structure. So uh, uh, we still need to rely on him to uh, do that final step to make sure that uh, the theoretical and, and the physical come together into a working system at, at each site. So I assume uh, this is Clark's WATX in Connecticut? Yes, that's correct. Um, I built the long wire that saved it at the last minute uh, when uh, they stopped begging vertical bridge to let them back onto the towers. Um, and I've been running it with a, um, with a PC that is seven feet from my butt in the basement here at my house. That's where the programming comes from. Um, and uh, we're keeping it going. Obviously, we want to get our money out of it. We want to feel good because we've saved a radio station for the community that, had, that it had served for all those years. But if I can also get the benefit of a, building a, a two element directional AM pattern there, then it really serves two purposes for me. So the frequency is what, 1280? 1220. 1220. Okay. So it's a bit smaller. Um, and um, uh, we have any number of ways to, it's expensive to build even one HEBA because uh, it's just, it's a lot of material. It's a lot of time. Um, on the other hand, if you don't have to buy a big chunk of land, if you don't have to clear it and bury a big buried ground system, if you don't have to have like guy wires and paint and all that maintenance cost. Um, by the way, the maintenance cost on this antenna uh, since it was built has been about a grand. And that was when we sent um, uh, Luke Willis 
from Broadcast Tower Service, formerly out there, and he he uh, did a very very close examination of the entire antenna, and he found exactly one weld that had been stressed, and he fixed it. Um, the the second sentence in that is that uh, a major hurricane and two big tornadoes have passed within very close. The hurricane went over it. Uh, and two big tornadoes passed within not a very far distance from that site since it was built without any damage at all to it. So uh, we're we're pretty happy with that. Yeah, Clark was a consultant when I was at WPIX in New York. He is a smart man. If you uh, the uh, the uh, streaming audio that comes out of my basement is the studio to transmitter link audio. And uh, if you just go to 1220WATX.com and click on Listen Live, um, he's in there every day massaging that music uh, because he really wants to attract um, a, a useful audience. Um, also, I'm running uh, one of those Orban XPN AM processors on it, and I can't say enough good things about it. If you go and listen to um uh the station in webster mass i have nothing whatsoever to do with the actual engineering of that radio station and the audio processing and the um uh, studio to transmitter link that they're using now and the audio quality on their digital audio delivery system i have nothing to do with that so how it actually sounds is not the fault of the antenna I'd like to uh, follow on about uh, building a directional array in terms of uh, the black arts. Kurt Gorman has said, uh, theoretically, he doesn't see any problem with being able to build one. He's done some calculations and uh, he's confident we can do that. And uh, we have a client uh, interested uh, uh, in doing that right now offshore. Now, there are no guys with this antenna, right? Right. It's yeah. got, we have a guide to the platform itself with Philly strain. We call them sway stays <laughs> because we don't want to use the word tower and we don't want to use the word guy, but it, it, it goes to the corners of the platform. It doesn't even go to the dirt near the platform. So that would mean much less land for a comparable uh, array. Exactly. Sure. You can put this on about a 2,500 square foot uh, uh, residential lot size. And we built the original, uh, the, the last prototype that's licensed now. It's 20 feet off the ground, partly because there's a hill just north of us. And we wanted to make sure that it didn't interfere with our measurements and give us funky readings. Uh, going forward, uh, 10 feet is probably going to be plenty. So you could put your, uh, uh, you could put a, uh, a container underneath it. Uh, you could put it on the roof of a building, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, we also have had uh, broadcast signal labs come out and do their annual uh, health and safety checks, uh, field checks, right? And this particular antenna has lower E field and H field in the near field than a comparable uh, quarter wave does. Thanks for pointing that out, John. And um, when uh, Broadcast Signal Lab came out to do those measurements, uh, Dave Peabody did those measurements and uh, he, he measured the E-field like he always does. And then when he did his report, he was careful to make sure that he had gotten extra measurements to say to be able to prove that there's absolutely nothing out there to worry about. But then he did the same thing that he always does. He did the little paragraph about every time we've ever measured the magnetic field on an AM radiator, it's been much lower than the E field in the near field. So we didn't bother to measure that. And I called him up and I said, this is a new device. We must measure the magnetic field. That's science. 
And so he came back about a month later with the magnetic NARDA probe and, and he did the uh, H-field measurements for us and did a second report about that. Um, and it, it, it's exactly what John just said. The, the signal coming off of this antenna in the near field is so low that all of the RFI problems in the studios and the offices of the building that's only about 60 feet away went away. No problems at all in there. And the new antenna is closer than the old antenna was. Right. Now, since it's so high off the ground, does it need to be fenced? Well, that, that's a good question. Uh, fencing the thing so that nobody can throw a ladder up on it and climb up there is always going to be good practice. Um, in general, um, um, I believe that any broadcast facility should have full fencing. Uh, if it, even the guide towers, people should have fences around their guy anchors. Otherwise, people can just drive into them more easily or get in there and actually do mischief. Uh, no, it wouldn't be necessary, um, but, you know, let's just do it for good reason. Brady, would it be, um, would it, if I was to visualize the, uh, the pattern, uh, where most uh, an, where most antennas are pretty much an umbrella, would this be like a mushroom then? Uh, the one you described me before. Uh, according to the uh, measurements and the calculations that were done by David Maxson's engineering team with Mini Neck, um, the the uh, elevation pattern is what that shows. How would you monitor this in a directional array, phase and amplitude? Um, the same way that we're doing now with shorter radiators. The FCC now allows you to literally just put a, um, a, a toroidal transformer in the feed to each tower. Okay. Um, and uh, because of the way this works, um, we're believing that we'll, it, we, we might have to characterize the overall phase shift through the feed networks in the back, in the boxes right at the uh, input to the HEBA uh, in, in case there might be a degree or two of difference. But back in the old days, uh, you didn't have to have um, a monitor point cable, uh, monitor antenna monitor cables that were the same length unless you were going to uh, get um, uh, method of moments approval. Um, and at least for now, we would be able to just, um, I, I believe, do it with toroids at the inputs to the networks that split the power between the D plate and the E cylinder. And based on uh, you know, what Grady was saying about the the, uh, the likely uh, limited coupling between elements in a directional array and the fact that this is incredibly stable from season to season, that once you've set it up and you've got your your you know phase and amplitudes set, um, your monitor is just going to sit there and gather dust because it's going to stay the same thing month after month after month. Great. Yeah. How soon do you expect this directional application to happen? <laughs> uh, because building an antenna such as this is so expensive, and because our investor group has been on this trail for over 14 years, so they're all 14 years older, those of us, those of us who are still here, uh, lucky enough to be so. 
we don't have a lot of money to just go, oh, let's just go build a couple of these things in an empty lot. And that also, uh, once again, it addresses the FCC requirement that you can't just go build something if you don't have a license for it. So we're in the position where in order to do an experiment, we either have to buy another radio station and own it, or we have to sell an antenna and apply to put a new antenna at a site that has a license. If I can add to that, Grady, just another thought, which is, as I mentioned before, our focus on the modeling side is right now is in terms of non-directional changes in materials and dimensions and frequencies and all that to learn more about the system and get more non-directional facilities operating. Uh, I know this may be an oxymoron, but if there is a directional AM owner that has an interest in pursuing this experimentally and some funds to help make it happen, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, the team would be interested in having a conversation. Well, the uh, Hamden station is a mom and pop operation, and I doubt that Clark has the funds to to install two of these. Well, that is based on the present condition of the uh, economics of the licensee. Uh, that radio station license uh, could be sold to someone who might want to develop it. Um, so um, I just, I would rather rather have something to bet on, uh, even though it doesn't have a real high reliability. Uh, but I mean, you know, because I'm presently in control of that site, uh, if we came across the money to do it from an investor one way or another, then the path forward would be there. Now, wouldn't it be worthwhile to uh, kind of give uh, the antenna for your experimental purposes? Well, Rich, yeah, but um, it doesn't just come out of somebody's pocket. I mean, to build one of these antennas is a lot of money's worth of materials. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of assembly time. Uh, I doubt that that our cost to build one of these things uh, for instance, at the frequency of 1220, uh, just just one of them, I doubt that we could get our costs down below 100 grand. Especially now that because of um, um, COVID uh, issues and the changes in the cost of the supply chain, um, a lot of these materials are more expensive to get, they're harder to get, they have to come from further away in some cases, and uh, it costs a lot to transport stuff back and forth. Our estimates for building a single one of these things in the upper half of the band were lower before COVID than they are now. So that would mean a couple hundred grand for Clark to do this. Or somebody. Well, I, you know, I know Clark uh, well enough to know that he he has an emotional attachment to this radio station. So I kind of doubt that he'd be willing to sell it. Well, whatever, or get somebody to invest in it and be part owner. I don't know if the radio station could be made permanent because right now it is running on an STA, on a long wire, but the FCC, because we're being very, very careful to run it, I mean, as far as the FCC rules about programs and issues and uh, uh, all those um, situations, I personally just spent over $3,000 buying a new EAS box for it. It came out of my retirement money. And I bought the Orban XPN AM processor, which those damn things list for $10,000. So um, we're serious about trying to uh, give this radio station a new life. And, and my position is that AM can come back from the brink of the cliff uh, because of 
in band on channel AM. I believe in it because we've been running in band on channel here in Boston on 650 off and on for the last year and a half. It's back on the air now. It's been on the air for about three weeks uh, because the people that are managing um, Alex Langer's um, properties since his passing uh, said we really need to get the get all of his stations back on the air so that we don't lose their value. Uh, and it's back on the air now. And if you want to come here, all digital uh, AM, MA3, it's on the air on 650. And you will be amazed at how well it covers. I'll try to get out there sometime soon. Rich, let's go eat. Come on. I've been <laughs> saying it for a year. <laughs> Well, that, actually, that leads two stations, W, uh, uh, let's see, WF, uh, FPG in uh, Webster, uh, I'd like to see, and WSRO. Yep, exactly. So as I can afford gas to get out there, I'll try. But I'm retired right now. I'm going to be in Boston for a couple of rock shows this weekend, so I'll definitely check it out. Very intrigued. Give me a call, Tim. If I can make it, I'll join you out there. Well, any other questions, uh, comments, um, information you'd like to have about the HEBA? I have a comment. Uh, it'd be nice to see this antenna on a, on a uh, building, a business building. We actually had a chance to build one of those uh, down in uh, New Jersey for Multicultural Radio. Uh, they were very interested. And then uh, their deal to use the building that they were intending to put it on fell through. And I believe they ended up turning the license in on that radio station. Um, I actually, MRBI is a uh, customer of mine. I'm their uh, local cluster studio engineer and one of their two transmitter sites. I manage those for them. Matter of fact, I'm their internet service provider at their transmitter site because they couldn't get anything that they could afford there from Verizon or Comcast. So I've got a Peplink router with a Verizon SIM card in it. And I've got a BrickLink running 64 kilobits per second. And uh, one of those um, Gainesville, Florida remote control systems that I like a lot. So, but that never got built. Um, it'll be interesting to, to see what happens. Now that nighttime uh, approval for at least our original site has been granted, and there appears to be a path forward to have uh, the FCC analyze on a case-by-case -case basis nighttime operation for more sites, and David Maxson's crew is uh, willing to work with us on that. I think we're probably less than a year away now from actually seeing activity uh, with this antenna that uh, would put an antenna on a roof. Now in Webster, is that uh, full time, same power? Oh, no, no. It's a Canadian clear channel frequency. I think they have to drop to four watts at night. Oh. But again, yeah. I'm I'm not the engineer for that station, uh, and so I don't keep that in my head. But I mean, the, the license is available. You could just go to LMS and pull the license down or or even go to my old favorite uh, AM query. It still works. They actually have it working again uh, and uh, pull the license down and get that information. Yeah, it is for Watts Grady. Oh. And, that, and that's the irony uh, of this process is that uh, what we needed to do is to convince the FCC on the first HEBA 
how to validate the vertical pattern. It just happens that because of the, the frequency and the location of the station, that it's nighttime uh, uh, power is uh, using any radiator <laughs> is limited. Um, so it's uh, uh, it's too bad we can't say that it's it's lots of watts. But the key thing was getting that antenna pa vertical pattern authorized by the FCC so that we can do that, replicate that on future applications. How far does the signal go at night? You're muted. Grady, you're muted. Hey, Grady, you're muted. Oh, the uh, former general manager of WGFP uh, is actually online with us now. And if he might want to just hop on and tell us what he knows about that nighttime signal, that would be useful. But if he wants to just, maybe he's gone to sleep. Oh, he unmuted. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> I, look, you guys are very, very smart, and I'm intimidated for me even being on here. But I would say this to you. Um, you guys have improved everything in broadcast, the microphones, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, consoles, uh, the soundproofing, the lighting, everything except the antenna. This is the first time, in my opinion, that we've had an upgrade in the antenna system, and I think it's been brilliant. We haven't touched this thing, except for the one time Grady mentioned, uh, since we've been there. Um, and I've owned it for, oh, I don't know, 15 years or so. Uh, so it's, it's a great addition to improving radio. I'd be more than happy to reaffiliate you with the WOR network, but it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're back to how far does it go at night? Uh, it, it goes um, <laughs> exactly as far as you would envision a four watt station to go. I, I can get it out the driveway. <laughs> But that wasn't the whole point, as Grady mentioned. Well, okay. Any final thoughts here, Grady, David, John? Well, I guess that's the uh, the story on the Heba for this week. And until some new changes occur, higher power, directional installation, or Grady hits the top of the charts, we'll have them back. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Gentlemen, thank you.